Welcome everyone. Uh, I'm Bill Doley, the president and CEO of Archaeology Southwest, a nonprofit based here in Tucson. Uh, and from our Tucson base is where we pursue our, our, our preservation archaeology mission. I want to start by acknowledging that Tucson is located on the ancestral lands of the Autumn Nation. Um, and tonight's speaker, Siler Conrad, is in Los Alamos, uh, New Mexico, uh, the traditional lands of the Tanoan and Karasin speakers. So take a moment at this point to contemplate and share your gratitude to the indigenous peoples whose ancestral lands you are a guest upon this evening. I also want to extend our thanks to the Smith family whose support makes the Avian Archaeology Cafe series possible. And we want to send out a little bit of extra love to Eldon Smith as he recovers from a recent, recent fall. And we wish his family members uh, Gene and Jay, uh, the best, our, our very best as well. So keep recovering and, and, and uh, thanks so much. So I think almost everyone has mastered the uh, basics of Zoom, so we won't go into that tonight. Um, so two years ago, uh, none of us realized that it was a place where you could actually spend the remainder of your lifetime. So <laughs> let's hope there's a... a future uh, outside of Zoom for us, uh, but it's, it's serving us well in the meantime. So you will have an opportunity to ask questions tonight. Uh, use the Q&A feature at the bottom. Linda will come in um, uh, at the end of the talk and, and uh, moderate the questions. So uh, that's always an important part of our presentation here. But uh, now you're asking, so who is this Siler Conrad, um, that gentleman over there in Los Alamos? Um, he's currently an archaeologist, a zooarchaeologist to be more precise, uh, and tribal technical liaison uh, at Los Alamos National Laboratory, as well as being an adjunct professor of archaeology at the University of New Mexico, where he earned his PhD in 2018. So um, as I was perusing his uh, resume this afternoon, uh, I've noticed that he's done a lot more than just work with birds. And I would, one particular article popped out titled Kangaroos and the California Gold Rush. But I digress um, because today um, Siler is going to be talking and sharing um, with us his uh, archaeological work related to turkeys with his talk entitled. Ancestral Pueblo Turkey Penning in Perspective. So Siler, um, don't get off on those kangaroos. Uh, let us hear about the turkeys. Thanks so much. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Linda. And, and thank you everyone who's, who's here tonight. I'm quite excited to give this talk and presentation. So let me pull it up here. Okay. I will hope and assume that everyone can see this okay right now and I'll get going. So tonight I really want to talk about turkey pinning and, and how that relates to this broader concept of management of turkeys in the past and really management of turkeys in the present as well by, by Pueblo peoples, by their ancestors here throughout the American Southwest, Mexican Northwest. And so the best place to start for me, I'm going to talk about Arroyo Hondo Pueblo. Uh, that's a site that's uh, right outside of Santa Fe. It's an ancestral village, and it provides a really important perspective, I think, for this concept of turkey pens and turkey management. I'm then going to go in and talk a little bit about sort of what we know ethnographically, ethnohistorically, and also archaeologically about the variation in turkey pens. And then I will hopefully summarize this all uh, into some <laughs> coherent ideas uh, that you can depart with about uh, sort of the importance and the role of really thinking about turkey pinning and trying to identify turkey pins uh, uh, within these archeological contexts throughout this region. So with that, I will dive right in here. Oops, there we go. Okay, for those of you who are not familiar, Royal Hondo Pueblo, a very large, uh, several hundred room ancestral village that's located right outside of Santa Fe, essentially between Santa Fe and, uh, and also sort of the uh, community of El Dorado. Uh, it's a classic period site. Uh, it was occupied roughly during the 1300s uh, into the early 1400s before it was abandoned. And it was excavated in the 1970s by the late 
Doug Schwartz and colleagues, uh, many, many colleagues of his uh, um, uh, through the School of American Research at that time, now School for Advanced Research. What's really quite intriguing about Arroyo Hondo is its huge faunal diversity. There are a lot of different animals that show up in that site zooarchaeologically. So we know that there is a large diversity of birds. Macaws also show up at the site. Um, uh, the community of Arroyo Hondo was very clearly focused on exploiting artiodactyls. That was a big part of their diet. But we also know that turkeys were extremely significant. Again, we're going to be talking about turkey painting here. We know that we have cut marks, butchered turkey bones. Turkeys were clearly being consumed. They were also being raised and managed within this village. I wanted to show this, this plot here of relative abundance. Um, Oro Hondo has several different temporal periods that it's been placed into, essentially the sequence of occupation. There's a component one and a component two. That's what this lead, red line signifies right here. Uh, but the critical part of, the, of this is, is really that turkeys were consumed or appear at the site quite consistently throughout time. So there is some variation, but roughly, you know, 5% of the relative abundance of the identified faunal assemblage from Arroyo Hondo is Turkey. So there are a large number of turkeys from, uh, from this ancestral village. What's quite interesting is that if you, if you analyze the stable isotopes, which are a proxy for diet, human diet, any other animal diet, it's really a sort of powerful technique. Uh, you're, you're examining and looking at uh, uh, sort of measuring it, what those stable isotope values tell you about the uh, sort of variation in potential plants or sources of other food protein uh, in this organism's dietary signal. And so this is some work that I completed with colleagues several years ago. You can see here, these are all turkey values. Uh, this is about 80 turkeys that we analyzed from Royal Hondo. What we found is that the bulk of these turkeys, almost all of them except for three, really fall in line with this concept, this idea that they're consuming maize. They're, they're being fed maize or somehow they have access to maize, which is a very clear C4 plant. It, it plots at about negative 10 when you're thinking about carbon isotopes. And, and this matches with what we know for human dietary signals across the, the ancient Southwest and, and, and really elsewhere. This is a very clear sort of C4 pattern. And this is what we expect for animals or humans uh, that are consuming corn. But it's important, again, we have sort of these three little turkeys that are hanging out here. They have a much different diet. What's interesting is Brian Kemp and his colleagues, uh, just a year after we published a stable isotope work, they went and, and analyzed the ancient DNA of these turkeys from Royal Hondo. And this really provided just a whole nother layer of information, just uh, fascinating. What they found is of, of all of these turkeys that are clearly consuming a maize diet, again, they're sort of accessing or being fed maize, they are part of this genetically identified domesticated Pueblo turkey. So this is a Pueblo turkey. It has a clear genetic signal. Uh, its physical form went extinct roughly around contact. So you can't see the physical form of this turkey today, but it was a Pueblo domesticated turkey. And then two of these three samples, there was uh, uh, no data was unsuccessful for the third, but two of these three turkeys that seem to have a more natural diet they were wild Merriam's turkeys. So again, this is sort of, you know, an added layer of context here. At Arroyo Hondo, when this village was occupied, when people were living throughout this community, we see that both domesticated turkeys and wild turkeys eating distinct diets are, are showing up at the site. This is quite important. So take that in context, turkey diet, telling us that they're somehow accessing this human crop, corn, maize uh, in the environment. We also see the ge genetics are telling us that we have essentially two different types of turkeys, although I will caveat that with something that's, that's quite important, I think. We should recognize that we may not fully understand if those two different types of turkeys that we identified genetically are really sort of distinct or separated in the past. It's very difficult for us to know or identify uh, for many reasons uh, how ancestral Pueblo people would have felt or experienced those turkeys. So that's an important point. But genetically speaking, we see that there are two different types of turkeys. We also see that those two different types of turkeys have different diets. So what's interesting about Arroyo Hondo Pueblo and what makes this village, this ancestral village quite important for, for understanding turkey management and turkey pinning is that the village had numerous pins that were excavated uh, and several different key plazas. So Plaza C, again, Plaza C over here, also Plaza G and Plaza K. So these two images, this is component one, this is sort of the, the earlier phase of occupation. This is component two, this is the later phase of occupation at the village. But what's quite important is that we see evidence of turkey pins showing up 
within these plaza contexts. So in plaza C, as an example, let's start here. We already see just a huge amount of variation in how turkeys are being pinned essentially throughout this uh, uh, sort of context or this location. Turkey pins are essentially a, a, along the plaza wall. They're, they're abutting the adjoining rooms. We also know from uh, several of these contexts that some of those adjoining rooms to the plazas were reused as turkey pins or potentially intentionally created to house turkeys. Uh, there's evidence in several of uh, the plaza contexts here uh, of an overhang essentially protecting, creating a roof for the turkeys. And we also, and this is quite important for the Plaza C context, there was a location here, and I have not been able to identify exactly where this, this occurred within the plaza, but there is an aggregation of turkey dung that showed up uh, within these contexts. And it really suggested individual turkey tethering of a, a possible just an individual bird, uh, something that's important that we'll talk about a little bit later on. But these pin contexts you can see here, post holes, they would have been subdivided, they would have been enclosed. Uh, these pins were often full of dung and, and, and really matted, compacted uh, turkey excrement. Uh, also turkey watering bowls show up in these contexts and a lot of turkey egg shells that show up as well. So again, these key identifiers, this is what makes Royal Hondo quite special and important is it really is this classic suite of evidence for identifying turkey pins uh, within these archeological contexts throughout this region. And as an example, this is a, a historic photograph from the early 20th century, probably the 1920s or 30s, but this is a turkey being tethered in Guatemala. So I just wanted to show this as an idea of how you might end up with a sort of localized aggregated pile of turkey excrement. It might be because you have a tethered turkey or a turkey that's, that's being uh, uh, sort of kept in, in an individual location through time. I think this is an important uh, sort of historic photo to, to try and help explain that context. We also see here some of the variation in the types of pins that show up. So this is a, a great example. The image here on the, the left-hand side, this is showing classic post holes of what these turkey pins would have looked like. You can actually see the image here on the right uh, showing this sort of rectangular pin. Uh, there, and there's evidence of turkey bones. Uh, again, turkeys that likely died or were buried within these contexts, uh, turkey ceramics. And, and what I mean by that are our ceramics being used as watering bowls are also showing up here. And for example, in Plaza K, uh, Plaza K, again, sort of this is on the northern side of the village, we have a cache of eggshells within these turkey pens. Uh, and, and there are a couple other locations throughout Royal Hondo where caches of eggshells likely occurred. But this is really interesting because in Plaza K itself, we see that throughout of Royal Hondo, we have variation in the types of turkey pins that are being constructed, being used. We have possible individual tethering events. We have turkeys that are being kept in the open within plazas. There are some turkeys that have these overhangs, for example, in Plaza C. Uh, there's also evidence in Plaza G, which was the last set of photos, that there are turkey roosts. So there are uh, essentially vigas that are being built into the exterior side of room blocks to, uh, to function as roosts for turkeys. And in Plaza K, we see sort of clutches of eggs. And something that's quite interesting is that using that stable isotope and DNA evidence, we know that from Plaza K, there's not only a cache of turkey eggs that are uh, clustered within this area, but there are also, of the samples analyzed, 11 domesticated turkeys. Again, these are Pueblo domesticated turkeys that have a maize-fed diet. And within that collection in Plaza K, there's also a wild, wild Merriam's turkey that has essentially a wild diet. So even within these individual contexts, we're seeing a quite a lot of variation on the types of turkeys and also how these turkeys are pinned just within one village at essentially uh, sort of the same time period. All of this is contemporaneous. So this is really important because it provides this idea that really sort of the later phases of uh, ancestral public activity here within this region prior to Spanish arrival, prior to Spanish contact, you see a, a lot of diversity in how turkeys were managed and how turkeys were pinned. And so this is a key, key component of this. I just wanted to, couldn't help myself, I wanted to show you uh, something that's really fascinating. It's not only do we have both wild and domesticated turkeys that are showing up uh, within these Plaza K contexts, we also see that the eggshells are showing variation in exactly what's going on with sort of the, the longevity or the use of turkeys. So this is an eggshell from Plaza K. This is showing, showing no reabsorption of all of these little cones. So this is the inside, the inner surface of an eggshell. 
this is what you would see if an uh, egg was just uh, perfectly laid and then someone cracked it open and looked at the inside at mammillary cones. Essentially, the, the chick inside the egg is reabsorbing uh, all of the elements from that eggshell to, to grow its skeleton, to grow and, and, and sort of provide those essential, uh, essential minerals and, and various elements. And so this is something that we expect from a turkey eggshell that might have been exploited immediately. Someone used it, someone perhaps ate the egg or, or used the egg to uh, treat, create paints or, or various other types of things. And so this is something that we see in Plaza K, but we also see this, eggshells which clearly show that turkeys were allowed to hatch. So this is an eggshell very late in that uh, incubation cycle, roughly you know, 21 days or later, essentially. Uh, and what you can see here is the same, same idea. These are all mammillary cone structures, but they've had extensive reabsorption of those cones. The cones are essentially gone. This is exactly what you expect to see if turkeys were allowed to hatch and, and increase those flock sizes. And so, you know, thinking about a Royal Hondo, and we're gonna transition here right after this slide, but thinking about a Royal Hondo, we have a, a really great example, a very large ancestral village, a lot of different activities, a lot of different people, lots of different human environmental and human animal interaction going on with various tax and various, various different types of species. And yet we see that same variation occurring with turkeys. So something that we, that we really conceptualize and view as a, a, a sort of an individual bird, there's quite a lot of variation within one village in this region of the Southwest at a Royal Hondo. We see different types of pins being used simultaneously. We see perhaps maybe special activities or special use or, or captivity of individual birds. Again, I'm thinking about that individual tethering event. We also see that turkeys are being consumed their relative abundance is roughly staying the same, but we see that they're being consumed. But turkey eggs are also being used, so there's variation in how the flocks are being managed. This is all critically important, especially as we think about the broader context within the Southwest. So let's keep thinking about a Royal Hondo, but I wanna move now to a few other archeological examples. If you take a diachronic approach and really look at how turkey pins have shown up in archeological context throughout this region. It's really quite exciting. There is a lot going on in how ancestral Pueblo peoples, the indigenous peoples of the Southwest really manage their turkeys. And, you know, something that shows up quite consistently is the variation and variability, even with individual localities, individual contexts, and, and sort of how this human turkey relationship occurred. And that's, that's quite an important, um, uh, component of this, I think, and, and I encourage us all, I, I hope, uh, you know, one of the key takeaways here is that this is something we need to be mindful of uh, uh, moving into the future when, when examining these contexts. So this is Broken Flute Cave. This is in Northeast Arizona. It's an Earl Morris site. Um, this was excavated in 1931, if I uh, understand correctly. The dates all range, these are tree ring dates, so roughly early 600s, essentially. So we're talking about quite an early, uh, sort of what we might term uh, essentially a basket maker site. What I want to call out to you here, if you look at these uh, rather uh, <laughs> sort of remarkable boots this gentleman is wearing, you might see this layer within this partially excavated pit structure, or what they called a pit house. This pit house number nine at this site. And you might see this dark vegetal layer. What's really interesting here is that this is a, a burn layer. So what they identified in the field is that the roof of this pit structure burned it was subsequently reused as a turkey pin. And this vegetal layer was full of uh, essentially turkey egg, or I'm sorry, turkey droppings, uh, sort of intact desiccated turkey droppings. And so the, the thought here was that people inhabited this space, people created this space, it burned and then was reused to house turkeys and probably several, it's a large, uh, sort of a larger space, a larger structure. But then, we see contexts like this. So this is the Spadefoot Toad site. So, so we're moving to Chaco Canyon now. Uh, this is in Chaco Canyon in sort of Northwest New Mexico. We can see here in room nine, uh, these, these little hashed areas, this is concentrations of eggshells. And uh, what Tom Wise identified at this site uh, through their excavation was that there are several cyst contexts, cyst features that are within room nine. And these functioned as essentially individual uh, uh, sort of turkey pins. Turkeys were kept in these spaces. So again, we see earlier, roughly 300 years earlier, Spadefoot Toad was, was occupied between the 900s and, and the uh, 1100s. We see that turkeys are being kept essentially in, in reused spaces that have burns, these large pit structures. 
We now see individual, perhaps, or sort of a small number of birds being kept within cyst features within individual rooms that likely would have had contemporaneous occupation at that same time. You can see here some of the eggshells that they found during excavation. Two different types of turkey pins. Again, similar contexts that are showing up at a Royal Hondo hundreds of years later, uh, but we see this diversity already present in the record. This is a classic site. I don't think I could give this talk without talking about the turkey pin sites. Uh, of course, Bill Leip and his colleagues, uh, this is in southeastern Utah. This is the uh, a structure that's been interpreted as essentially a, a possible individual turkey pin. But what's quite curious is that the site, of course, gets its name from this structure, but the structure itself dates a little bit later to the thousands to essentially 1200s likely. Uh, the site itself though has a, a, a record that dates to essentially AD 1 to 200 is, is what's commonly uh, identified as uh, with domesticated turkeys already present and those turkeys are consuming maize. So again, this is one of those other places where we see that this, this turkey pin site has a essentially a, over a thousand year record of human occupation and human use in the landscape. And we see turkeys being managed and kept in these spaces in different ways. And in fact, the earliest occupation when, when ancestral Pueblo domesticated turkeys are identified within those contexts, they're consuming maize. And this is essentially uh, some of the earliest evidence we have for these types of domesticated turkeys within the broader Southwest region. And yet uh, roughly a thousand, 1200 years later, we see that there are still individual structures at this location that are being used perhaps to keep single turkeys, perhaps multiple turkeys, but these individual pins that show up in the landscape. And I should note that Earl, Earl Morris and others identified individual structures like this at many basket maker uh, sites throughout Northeast Arizona, especially. And so this is, a, this is one of these very common, very important type of diagnostic tools to try and trace and identify you know, where are these turkey pins in these contexts and, and really what does this mean about this human relationship with these birds? Okay. I'd, again, another classic site, uh, quite similar, uh, sort of located close roughly uh, to Arroyo Hondo is Sapal Wingate Pueblo, uh, again, Northern Rio Grande. This is a great photo. Uh, this is a common photo. I'm sure folks have seen it before, but uh, this is in room 49. And what's quite important here is this yellowish layer that you can see here at the bottom portion of the room. This is really significant. This is what you would find with this concentrated aggregated turkey dung. So again, at some of the earlier, earlier types of ancestral places that are found throughout the Southwest, you might find desiccated turkey droppings. Uh, that's the case of Broken Flute Cave, for example. Uh, but here, especially in these larger village contexts, often what you start to find are these desiccated layers of, uh, of sort of organic, material. They often have this yellowish color, this yellowish hue, and this is turkey dung. These are very clear turkey dung deposits. And this is one of the, you know, Arroyo Hondo, also I would argue Pindi Pueblo, which is quite close to Arroyo Hondo, uh, to Arroyo Hondo just in Santa Fe or just south of Santa Fe. You know, these are some of these early sites that had important excavations. They really helped kind of define how we interpret, how we contextualize some of the evidence uh, for various components of ancestral Pueblo life. And this idea of these yellow, sort of dense concentrated mats of, of turkey dung, this is a hallmark of how to identify turkey pins within this area. And so Paul Wingate, one of the largest ancestral villages in the Southwest, clear evidence for human relationships with turkeys. Uh, you know, folks have argued that this is a, an area where it's essentially a turkey farm for turkey feathers, but there are many pin contexts, many turkey burials. Turkeys clearly held a very important role here as they did at Arroyo Hondo Pueblo and as they did at, at several of these other locations where there's an intentionally defined and created space for their well-being, for their management. And so that's, that's important. So these ver the, the variation in these archeological examples, uh, these various contexts that uh, folks have identified through excavation, especially during the 20th century, this is intriguing when you compare this to what we know ethnographically, ethno-historically, essentially in the post-contact era. You know, the Spanish were uh, uh, sort of um, uh, quite, uh, what's the right word here, quite direct in their interpretation of what they viewed as uh, sort of patterns in, in Pueblo life, uh, often incorrectly. Uh, but what we see is that, you know, uh, the Spanish really talked and described this idea that 
that Pueblo peoples were managing turkeys in a way that's very similar to sort of the free ranging of sheep, for example, uh, in the environment where turkeys were allowed uh, to sort of move outside of villages. Uh, perhaps Pueblo people, Pueblo children were taking those turkeys out, uh, letting them uh, essentially forage and then maybe coming back into the village at night or, or nearby the village. But what we see is that you know, if you take those records and compare them to, to sort of clear evidence for pins in these contexts, it's important because it shows this long-term connection, you know, essentially 2,000 year connection that we're talking about where ancestral Pueblo people are practicing the same type of adaptive sort of flexibility uh, and sort of adaptive uh, sort of management of turkeys and of birds. They're really able to pin these animals in different types of contexts. And some of those contexts change through time. Some, some of those contexts are consistent, but there's, there's a lot of variation that you find throughout the earliest records and the latest records and how ancestral public peoples were interacting with these birds. And so that's quite important. Um, and this is something here, this, this image, this is from Zuni Pueblo, uh, showing essentially uh, uh, an eagle uh, uh, type of cage or pin. Uh, and you know, this is a, it's an important image because it likely reflects what you might find, a, a sort of a similar type of pin structure um, at some of these ancestral villages throughout this area. But we also see, again, this idea of sort of free ranging turkeys, that turkeys weren't pinned, and, and really in some cases that turkeys weren't consumed, turkeys weren't used, there were maybe individual turkeys that were used for their feathers. Again, this is all coming from sort of the Spanish record, but it's of course much, much more complex, especially when looking at this through time. And so we see this what I assume to be a tom based on that turkey beard right there. Uh, sort of this is at Zuni Pueblo, uh, sort of able to sort of free range, sort of roam these uh, uh, sort of fields or the what is identified as Walden Gardens when this photo was taken. I, this to me really speaks to the fact that the ancestral Pueblo relationship with turkeys and how turkeys were managed in the variation in turkey pens through time you know, this is not something that the Spanish were able to, to really change or remove. I, I think that uh, sort of Pueblo people kept this consistency through time. And, and something that I argue, I'll, I'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, but I, I think that the record that we see within this region really speaks to the fact that introduced domesticates uh, from the Spanish uh, at post-contact or at contact, they were able to integrate with Pueblo life quite, quite easily. You know, the husbandry of those animals occurred uh, potentially quite easily because of this long, long-term relationship for millennia uh, that Pueblo peoples had with turkeys and the similar types of uh, a, a sort of flexibility that Pueblo peoples uh, uh, sort of allowed with their management of turkeys. And we'll talk about this in just a little bit. This is also a great photo. This is that from Hopi Pueblo, again, sort of early 20th century. I like this. It shows these turkeys here. It shows a sheep. And if you look into the back, it shows some chickens here. Again, all these animals are free. They're able to sort of uh, roam about, presumably. Uh, we could take many things from this photo, but I think it really speaks to the idea that Pueblo peoples had this intimate relationship with turkeys, and they were able to pin them and manage them variably, depending on, on uh, sort of their, their agency, their choice, what they needed at that time, and perhaps those spaces. And so that's a, a, a sort of uh, a hallmark, I think, of this, just, just showing the, the variation in all these different animals uh, within the same type of context. Alrighty, so uh, sort of to kind of uh, take us through some summary thoughts here, I think we're doing okay on time. When working in these contexts, and something that I found when sort of reviewing these archaeological records, when reading about folks uh, who have tried to identify turkey pens, you almost always have a turkey pen when you have turkey dung. In fact, I don't know if I've come across a clear record of a situation in which there is turkey dung or turkey excrement, and, and that does not mean that you have a turkey pen. So essentially, you can, you can have pretty solid confidence that if you have turkey dung, especially uh, sort of accumulated or aggregated within certain spaces, and these could be spaces that are uh, sort of anthropogenically modified or perhaps non-anthropogenically modified. There, there are several records of sort of natural voids, for example, in uh, canyon walls perhaps being used as essentially a turkey pen. And so again, identifying turkey dung, that's really the, the clearest way to find a turkey pen or to try and identify, okay, we have turkey dung. This should lead us into the direction of trying to understand, you know, what's the context of this space and 
And what does this mean potentially for pinning turkeys or the management of turkeys uh, at that location? I've, I've mentioned this before, this idea of this consistent variation. This is something that's quite striking to me. You know, there are, there are many arguments, uh, very you know, solid, strong arguments in the Southwest about how humans use turkeys differently through time, uh, especially the turkeys originally really were used for their feathers. That's potentially their main uh, sort of form of exploitation and that later in time they were consumed. But it's really interesting to see that even later in time in ancestral villages and other places where we see clear evidence for turkeys being consumed, we see the same type of variation in how turkeys are pinned and managed that we see at some of the earliest sites where our arguments are that turkeys were just being kept for feathers. So again, I think, I think that this is something that we need to uh, sort of investigate much further to try and understand why is this variation so consistent? And what does this really mean about, you know, some really important unanswered questions about essentially how the domestication of turkeys really occurred, where it occurred, what types of turkeys it occurred with. There are so many important questions that I think focusing on turkey pens and really that idea of turkey management through pinning, through that, through that captivity, it's one way to sort of untangle and answer some of those questions. Again, long-term flexibility, I think this was really important in, in this relationship and especially the introduction of domesticates into the Southwest, it's very clear that this long-term human relationship with turkeys, and again, I'm focusing on turkeys, but I would argue that there are also many other animals that could be tied into this but the long-term relationship with turkeys and how Pueblo peoples managed them, kept them, and, and essentially uh, uh, sort of had them pinned through time really facilitated what I would argue is a much easier transition to some of these Spanish domesticates in this environment because of the similar types of uh, sort of potential pinning or management strategies that were employed post-contact. And so thinking about pins, I just think they're so cool. And I really encourage everyone to <laughs> sort of try to identify these uh, and, and track them down. There are, there are so many turkey pens that are written about that are, that are sort of hidden uh, sort of in, in these site reports and various descriptions. And it's so clear that, that we really don't have a great idea of sort of the broad geographic range and the diversity within that range of the different types of pens that people had. And until we can try and answer some of those questions on this variation, I think that we're that that we really don't have a. Uh, maybe it's better to say I think we're really missing a key component of the story: this human relationship with these turkeys. Because something that I think is really cool about turkeys is that turkeys have agency themselves, and I I have never kept turkeys, although I would not mind to have to convince my family. Uh, but I think that I I, I think that you know, the agency of turkeys is important here. And so their ability to sort of choose this uh, sort of pinning or management at the same time that ancestral Pueblo peoples are choosing to keep them captive or not, or to sort of interact with them in different ways, it really uh, starts to, I think, uh, sort of influence the ideas we have around this long-term process of turkey domestication, turkey husbandry, and turkey management, which are three distinct things, but they're, they're very closely related and tied together. Okay. And with that, I just want to say thank you again to all of you for spending your evening here with me, uh, especially Archaeology Southwest, Chris Schwartz, Kate Bishop for sort of organizing this, but also Linda, Bill, thank you. Thank you so much. And also to Kate for sort of helping with all of this. A lot of folks to thank. Uh, this is not the entire list. This is sort of long-term research. And I think uh, there's a whole group of us that are interested in turkeys in the Southwest and probably owe thanks to every single one of them. Um, Please feel free, you're welcome to reach out and contact me if you would like, happy to chat more about this. And uh, one final thing is that this, the, the, what I presented here, you can read more about this if you're interested. Oops, I apologize. Uh, in this recently published paper, and this is open access articles, so you're, you're able to Google it, download it. Um, please reach out if you have questions or thoughts and, and thank you again. And with that, I will mute myself here. Well, you don't want to mute yourself because we got to answer questions. So you don't want to mute point. yourself. <laughs> there we go. Thank you, Siler. That was yeah. really interesting. You know, I have a special place in my heart for turkeys. So yes. it was, this was a fun, fun one to listen to. Yeah, to learn a little bit more about. So 
So yeah, there's a reminder for everybody in case you guys have not been at a cafe before. If you've got questions for Siler, put it in the Q&A and I'm going to sort of curate and throw some questions um, his way and see if we can have a little bit more discussion. So um, there was a question early on, Siler, just to clarify about um, what, what kind of, what species of turkey are we talking about? Are these, uh, yeah, are there subspecies? Uh, yeah, okay, so <laughs> there, that's an excellent and complicated question. Oh, sorry. Uh, no, 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 that's, I, I think it's really important and it's, it is good to talk about. So uh, two, a couple things come to mind. Um, so in reality, we're probably talking about subspecies of turkeys, and again, this gets into this concept of what is a species. So for example, the ancestral Pueblo domesticated turkey that we can identify genetically, it clearly went feral in many circumstances or instances and interbred with wild Merriam's turkeys that are essentially found throughout the Southwest today. That doesn't, that really, I mean, there's a fundamental concept that would, that would argue, I suppose, uh, that those are not species because they're able to interbreed and produce, produce offspring. So we're probably talking about subspecies of the same species, but, you know, when thinking about turkeys in the Southwest, the idea of domesticated turkeys, and this is a really critical point, um, no matter what their genetics, we know that both wild Merriams and the Pueblo domesticated turkeys were domesticated turkeys. And so taking a step back, philosophically, I suppose, they were managed by peoples, they were fed individual foods, they were husbanded, these are domesticated turkeys. So in many ways, while the genetics are quite important to the story, and they're very, very important, the concept of species, I think we have to sort of remove ourselves from, and especially, and maybe more importantly, sort of something that we can't do, but trying to understand the indigenous perspective of how those birds were viewed, because perhaps they were viewed as separate species, perhaps they weren't, perhaps there's much more diversity than we can fully understand. So I hope that answers that question. Great, yeah, and you know, speaking of that sort of as a follow-up, um, there was a question about, were folk domesticating Turkey like down here in the Holcomb area, Maguillon area, do you know? Ah, that's, I, well, so I, I think the, there's the, that question still stands, but I know that some folks are working on this right now. It, it seems as though the answer is yes, these Pueblo domesticated turkeys show up in these areas, but there's still so much to do. I mean, turkeys, they show up at so many different types of ancestral places, so many different villages. I mean, there's, there are so few samples that have really been analyzed to try and understand that. But I think the answer is that yes, but I can't point to any line of evidence that supports that, just sort of what is existing in the turkey world right now. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool. There's been a couple questions, let's see. Well, there's been a couple questions about like uses of turkeys and whether yeah. you could, could um, if, you, if you have any more information detail about like, you know, to what degree were they being used for food versus for feathers? Yep. Um, and, you know, how would you know that they were using it for feathers, for example? Are there artifacts or something that give us some indication of that? Or? Yep, that's a good question. I, so, yes, on that last part that you just asked, there are several artifacts. There are different types of objects that, that help um, uh, confirm this, this idea. So, for example, uh, turkey feathers are found, especially in many early sites, uh, the sites have good preservation. We see evidence of of turkey feathers being used variously in different types of ways. Uh, Bill Leip and his colleagues just recently published an excellent paper talking about turkey feather blankets, essentially, and the importance of those. They would have been critically important in the Southwest, and they're so warm and soft. If you have a chance to feel a turkey feather blanket, I would uh, definitely recommend it. Uh, so we know that turkey feathers were being used. There are some cases where you can actually see evidence from turkey feathers being plucked. So Bill talks a lot about this uh, and his colleagues in, in that paper. You know, uh, although live plucking is really frowned upon today, there are ways to do it with turkeys that are uh, quite ethical and, and don't really pain or harm the animal. And so the idea is that living turkeys were actually plucked essentially for some feathers. And you can see some of that evidence on certain bones. In fact, that's been identified on macaw bones, this uh, sort of morphological change when you have plucking of feathers over time. Uh, so we know that turkeys were being used for feathers. In fact, 
Earl Morris, uh, again, talking about sort of Broken Flute Cave, um, also Pocket Cave and some of those other locations. And Broken Flute Cave, one of the pit structures that was next to, uh, essentially nearby the pit structure that was used as a, reused as a turkey pen, uh, there was a hide bag, uh, probably a deer hide bag, that was full of turkey beards, uh, several turkey beards. Uh, so it was a really sort of individual specific uh, uh, type of uh, object that was, that was excavated and recovered. So turkey feathers were quite important. We also know uh, we find a lot of evidence for turkey tools, so their bones. However, the turkeys may have died. Uh, they were used as awls, flutes, and whistles. They were quite important. Birds were quite important for, for their use in sort of musical instruments. Um, we also know that turkey eggs, they were consumed, they were important for their role in essentially increasing flocks, but turkey eggs, the albumin, that protein within the egg can be used as a paint binder. And so there's a lot of evidence, especially ethnographically, uh, that Pueblo peoples, indigenous peoples here throughout this region were using eggs from various important taxa uh, as a binder for paint creation. And of course, turkey meat. We know this from cut mark bones, butcher bones, uh, also uh, uh, burning and other lines of essentially zooarchaeological evidence that, that turkeys were being used for meat. And maybe one of the more important ones that we, that I think we need to think about more is the iconographic, sort of the, the non-physical presence of how turkeys were used. So turkey imagery, the sounds of turkeys, the calls of turkeys, all of these things would have played a really important role in their relationship with, with indigenous peoples throughout this region. And, and those are some components that we can sometimes get from, from rock art and other evidence, especially painted ceramics, for example, but we're really missing you know, a, a sort of a, a clear idea, I would argue, of how, how that played a role in this relationship. So that's, that's sort of the broad scale of use, I think. You mentioned um, rock art and stuff, and there was a question, um, if you could, if there's anything to follow up, is is there rock art imagery of turkeys and stuff, especially in the in the Rio Hondo area? Ah, uh, yes. I oh my, I uh, there there is an enormous amount of turkey oh. rock art, uh, especially turkey tracks. Turkey tracks are quite important. Um, images of the birds themselves, images of other birds, they appear frequently throughout this entire region. Santa Fe and sort of the northern Rio Grande, for example, has a lot of rock art imagery. There, there's, there's quite a bit. Um, I'm trying to think of maybe perhaps something more to indicate, but there are some instances, for example, this is not rock art, but from painted ceramics, where in the Tewa world, we see almost identical imagery of turkeys and other birds, and they show up in different types of villages sort of throughout the Rio Grande Valley. And so this is uh, these are biscuit wares, these are sort of later classic periods. Um, uh, you know, we're talking 1400s, essentially 1500s. You know, the, the imagery of turkeys is really important. And it is possible because we're missing the physical form of that Pueblo domesticated turkey. It's, it's almost, I mean, it's, it, it's really, I think, important to imagine and think about, you know, what did that turkey look like and how does that influence some of the iconography that we see, whether it's in rock art or ceramics, what would that have meant for this human relationship with these birds, especially because of the wild Merriams that were inhabiting this area and they could be caught in the wild essentially simultaneously. And we know that that was happening. So there's a lot of interesting things that still need to be identified with uh, Turkey rock art. So I, it's something I'm fascinated with. <laughs> it's fun, it's fun. Mm -hmm. There's been a number of questions. Um, people are, at, are um, interested to talk about dung more for a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> um, sort of like, do you, do you know, was it being used? Like there's uh, several questions about like, are they using it for fertilizer? Yeah. Um, what, what, would it have been used or just let there sit there or? <laughs> yep, okay, so bear with me for a moment. I'm okay. going to, I'm <laughs> gonna go back to a slide here really quickly. I just wanna show some of this isotope data real fast. So. Mm -hmm. That's a really important question. Um, and in fact, we, when I was, that paper I showed at the end, I reached out to several folks, and they, they might be on this, uh, this talk right now, trying to understand sort of who has written about this and who has sort of proposed this idea. Because of course, dung, fertilizer, this is sort of natural manure, essentially. It could be a very uh, sort of useful form of fertilization for uh, domesticated crops, uh, for maize or, or various other types of crops that Pueblo peoples were planting and farming. But what's really odd is that 
there are several instances where we find turkey eggs, but we do not find turkey dung. So that could indicate that the turkey dung was removed perhaps and used in fields or other types of contexts, but it would be very difficult to remove turkey dung and not simultaneously remove turkey eggshells or the evidence of these eggs. So there's a little bit of a discrepancy there. It doesn't make a lot of sense, uh, sort of why there would be one or the other. There are some possibilities, but maybe what's more important to this question about fertilization is the fact that if you look at other stable isotope values for animals, but more importantly, for, uh, for humans. Uh, so there are some, uh, there are some human remains that, that have been studied uh, using stable isotopes. And what we see is that turkeys themselves, their nitrogen value, which, rela which relates to protein. So turkey fertilizer, essentially, I, if it was being used as a fertilizer for corn, you would expect the nitrogen value in the corn to essentially be enriched higher than the turkeys themselves. And this is because it's this idea of what are you eating? So you're reflective of what you're eating. And so in nitrogen, uh, there's a very clear pattern of you sort of are moving up this trophic scale. And so you would expect that corn uh, would actually be more enriched, for example, um, uh, if you had uh, uh, sort of, if it was being fertilized with turkey dung. But what we find is that turkeys themselves seem to be more enriched than humans, for example. So this implies that even though humans are also eating corn, they do not seem to be eating sort of turkeys through turkey dung that's being used as fertilizer for the corn that then humans are eating. So if you trace this pattern and sort of the routing of those isotopes, uh, it really suggests that, that turkey dung is not being used as fertilizer. But I would preface that by saying that no one has really studied this in any direct way. And there clearly needs to be more done because we have a small sample of turkeys throughout the entire cell Southwest that folks have uh, studied for stable isotopes. We have a smaller uh, sort of sample population of humans uh, that have been studied in a similar way. And we have essentially no record of turkey dung that's ever been measured for stable isotopes or, or any other type of geochemical proxy that might tell us if it's being used as uh, a fertilizer. And the same would be true for, for corn. We're really sort of missing that evidence. So there are ways to test it. I'm not convinced that it was done, but there shouldn't be any reason why it could not have been done. I think that there's probably something else going on with sort of these contexts where we're missing turkey dung, but it seems like turkeys were, were still pinned. Well, and, and sort of related, I think sort of related as a little bit of the follow-up was there was a question from um, a woman who's, she's asking, are turkeys the only domesticated species that you're finding at these sites? And yeah. if there were other species, how, can you distinguish a dung pile between species? <laughs> yes. Yeah, you know, that's, that is a good question. Um, in terms of other domesticated species, it would be important to note that uh, turkeys are not. So dogs, uh, dogs are quite important. They were found throughout this area. Uh, also, um, they're, they're maybe Chris Schwartz or, or Kate could talk more to this later on, but uh, macaws, I think there's very clear sort of evidence now, this idea of of sort of domesticated macaws, especially if we're thinking about domestication and, and really how it relates to human management of these birds. Um, so there, there are definitely other species. Those are the two that are probably the clearest in terms of what we think of a classic example of, of domestication. I don't know. I, I think that, yes, it is definitely possible to differentiate, uh, say, sort of dog excrement from turkey excrement. I'm not sure that would be the case for macaws, but often macaws are found in such a smaller uh, sort of abundance, I suppose. Maybe at uh, Pocky if uh, any dung deposits survive, that might be one location where you could compare turkeys versus macaws. That would potentially be quite interesting, actually. Uh, but it's it's just such an intriguing idea because there are so many turkeys that were clearly managed. There are so many turkeys that were on the landscape just naturally. Um, and these dung deposits show up and they're, they're quite extensive. I mean, I think there was an early description in the Mesa Verde region of uh, sort of dung deposits. I, I hope I don't misquote this, but essentially like maybe 20, 20 feet, something like that, uh, sort of in height. And with, I mean, there are massive types of deposits that are often found in the backs of shelters and other types of areas. So, you know, turkey droppings, uh, 
you would expect that if they're being used for fertilizer or if other species, if, if sort of manure from other types of species were being used, that they would not show up. And yet we see this extensive record of uh, turkey dung. So it's a good question. Wow. Wow. Yeah. That's cool. Well, you jumped, you went right to this next question. So mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you to elaborate is mm -hmm. whether you can, and here comes the train, but I'll get the question yeah. real quick. Um, can you speak about turkey pens at Pacame? And do you uh, see this is related to ancestral Puebloan traditions or more Mesoamerican traditions? Ah, uh, so that's a good question. I guess I should say, first off, I, you know, the the relationship between turkeys in Mesoamerica and sort of the north northern northwestern Mexico and sort of the American Southwest is quite intriguing because hopefully folks are aware that there are different domesticated populations. There are different wild populations. They were both used simultaneously through time, but there seems to be no uh, sort of movement of those birds. Essentially, there are no domesticated turkeys coming into the Southwest, just like there are no Southwest turkeys going into Mesoamerica that we can currently identify. But also, uh, so Aaron Thornton, Kitty Emery, uh, they wrote a great paper uh, several years ago and they really went through the evidence for sort of turkey domestication and husbandry uh, in Mesoamerica. And it's very clear that turkey pins and sort of this idea of turkey pins, it's much more ephemeral, I think is safe to say within Mesoamerica. And so we don't have, they do not have, as far as I'm aware, sort of clear evidence of these turkey pin contexts. Like we might identify it, Arroyo Hondo, Zapawinge, Pendi Pueblo, Broken Food, you know, and the list goes on and on, any of these other locations. So I would argue and I'm now a little bit forgetting the question, but I think that there are distinct differences. And at Pakime especially, I think the Pakime and the pens within the Membres and Magillon region, especially Elk Ridge, for example, uh, those pens are much more similar. And they're essentially, uh, you know, they look like the pens throughout the Northern American Southwest, throughout this entire Southwest region. And so I, I don't think it would be appropriate in terms of thinking about how humans are interacting and managing turkeys in the environment, I don't think it would be appropriate to differentiate the Pakime pens from any of the other pens throughout the Southwest. Now, again, Pakime is a sort of a grand scale, I think. You know, it's very similar to uh, sort of Sapa Winge in the sense that you have this really enormous industry that's focused on birds. And yet, we see the same types of pens and, and really the same type of human relationship with those birds in these different contexts. And so, I, it, there's clearly a very similar activities going on from a human perspective on that relationship. Thank you. Thank you. Because mm -hmm. um, um, of the I, I, one thing I wanted to mention earlier, just as FYI, is you talked about um, turkey feathers and turkey feather blankets and stuff. Yeah. And Bill Live is going to be speaking about um, that later on in a cafe. So stay tuned. We'll be yeah. talking more about turkey feathers. <laughs> um, but uh, straightforward question. Do Pueblo people today capture wild Miriam's turkeys to raise in the Pueblos? Yes. I, I think the answer is yes. Uh, but I probably can't say that with 100% confidence. I, I would say that from the 20th century, especially when there was still some ethnographic work that was that was occurring within the pueblos, uh, there are a lot of descriptions. For example, from Taos Pueblo, where only wild Merriams were captured and brought into the pueblo, where the they were then kept uh, and essentially managed as domesticated turkeys. So, you know, there, there's a the important part about this is I think the answer is yes, but the role, the very tragic role of the extirpation of turkeys from this, uh, from this area, you know, essentially post-contact turkeys were overhunted. They were pushed out of areas, uh, uh, you know, farmlands, agriculture, all sorts of things sort of uh, impacted uh, turkey habitat, turkey abundance in the landscape. And so a lot of areas within the greater Southwest uh, sort of lost their turkeys. And so I think that today it's really hard to imagine or understand what that relationship between the Pueblo domesticated turkeys and the wild Merriams would have been like, just because we're really missing that biogeographic understanding of exactly where those turkeys were in the environment and, and how Pueblo peoples were able to interact with them. And so I, I often wonder actually, I, you know, thinking about, I'm gonna take a step in a much different direction for a moment, sort of National Stork Preservation Act and, and some of the other federal regulations that 
really, uh, especially NAGPRA, for example, that really guides sort of our understanding of uh, potential significant ceremonial sort of items, objects for indigenous peoples. I often wonder how turkeys play a role in that because the wild merriams today in the Southwest that you can go, you can get a permit, you can hunt, you can see them occasionally. They may or may not be a nuisance perhaps, uh, depending on your <laughs> sort of love of turkeys. Some of those turkeys almost undoubtedly have genetic material from the Pueblo domesticated turkey that was lost again in its physical form at contact. So what does that mean about sort of the traditional property, the cultural patrimony of wild Merriam's turkeys within the Southwest today? I think it's a uh, sort of an important question we, we might want to consider when thinking about sort of indigenous landscapes, these cultural landscapes and the environment itself. And I think turkeys are intricately tied. You cannot disconnect them from that indigenous experience uh, sort of uh, throughout this region. Yeah. That's a really good point. That's a really good point. Yeah, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. Um, there's been a, several comments and questions. I think people really appreciate your um, perspective about turkeys having their own agency. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and it's true, you know, yeah. but there's been several folk who've mentioned that they, they appreciate that and that, yeah. that that is indeed, um, you know, their experiences that turkeys can be free, happy to do all sorts of different things. Um, yeah. And there was a question early on about, or something, a statement related to that, which was mm. that, you know, in terms of your, your wild turkeys that you've mm. seen at, at Arroyo Hondo is that, mm -hmm. you know, do you suppose that they recognize that the food's there. If they drop in, they might as well just come and have some dinner with the pen guys. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, I think people were getting your your issue about um, agency, which is cool. Yep. Yep. Exactly. I mean, and and maybe a, another thought to add on to that, uh, this idea of sort of commensalism and and sort of perhaps wild turkeys just naturally. I mean, you know, turkeys themselves today, you'll find them I, again. That classic article uh, uh, from Mesa Verde, sort of talking about the nuisance of turkeys. I mean, they, you know, they know where there's food, and they will, <laughs> they will go, they will go for it. Um, I and I think that's uh, that's a big part of that story to consider for villages like Royal Hondo. The other thing that's really intriguing, I think, about this idea of of sort of wild turkeys is that at Royal Hondo, for example. Uh, the original investigators made a, an argument. I, I would, I, I buy it. I think it's uh, quite accurate that there are a smaller number of dogs at that site because turkeys were much more important. And turkeys and dogs, again, this interaction sometimes positive, sometimes negative. I, um, you know, so you don't want turkeys injuring the dogs or dogs injuring the turkeys. And based on the spurs on some of those toms, I can imagine that the dogs might not be so lucky in that type of uh, circumstance. Um, but also I think that at a Royal Hondo, when we see these, when we see this evidence based on, again, it, the contextual evidence, the turkey pins, the stable isotopes, the DNA, it's really this, this uh, accumulation of evidence. It kind of speaks to the idea that perhaps this idea of sort of how turkeys were husbanded. And so I'm talking now about sort of the breeding of turkeys the importance of perhaps wild turkeys for their genetics, sort of for you know that that genetic diversity. Pueblo peoples, indigenous peoples, would certainly have known this. They they almost undoubtedly practiced this of sort of taking wild chicks, taking perhaps hens or toms from the environment, and perhaps this is why we see sort of some of these birds in in, in these types of contexts. But this is essentially speculation. There's still so much work that needs to be done to figure this out. Sounds like there's lots of stuff to do still. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Well, I think we're getting close to time. I probably should wrap this thing up for us for the day. Thank you so much, Siler. Um, this was really a really interesting presentation and it's clear people really enjoyed it. So I think you've got us started off really well. Um, Thank you. And um, yeah, I think um, Siler has made it clear if you want to talk to him anymore, yep. you know, you can connect with him. But. Um, maybe if you want to stop sharing your screen, okay. we'll ask Bill to come back and we'll just do a little quick wrap up here. Thank you so much, everyone. Really right. appreciate it. See if Bill will come back and join us. Yes. Can stay on the screen, Siler, so we can look at you. Siler, thank, <laughs> thank you so much. That was wonderful. <laughs> I've been at, a, at SAA, Society for American Archaeology meetings, um, having a conversation with Bill Light, for example, and he'll say, okay. I have to go to my turkey uh, group that's meeting over at the bar over there. And um, 
I think that a good analogy, um, the group to get into that turkey group, uh, it's like they have at the amusement park, you have to be this tall to get on this ride. I think you have to have this kind of energy level to get into the turkey group. <laughs> You've exhibited an, an, a wonderful intensity and, and level of uh, energy tonight and shared this a, a beautiful uh, presentation. And on that note, Bill, I'm sorry, I forgot. There was one comment I meant to share because there was a comment from an individual who said, yes, you should raise some turkeys. So <laughs> encourage, go for it. Appreciate it. Well, I think this whole session on avian archaeology, I think um, it is one of those high energy topics. And I think we'll see more of that as we go through the season here. So, um, and there's going to be an issue of our Archaeology Southwest magazine coming out in, um, in sort of the middle of the, the, the session here. So, uh, but next month, it's only a month away, uh, November 2nd, same uh, time that first Tuesday of uh, the month, we'll have Sean Dolan and he'll be discussing the turkeys of the Mimbris Valley. So we've got a really uh, nice one, two, three uh, series on turkeys here to end out 2021 and get us into the next round of, of this. So thank you all uh, very much. Um, and again, Siler, thanks for um, a really, really uh, well presented and, and your uh, discussions. Um, we learned a lot all throughout this. And Linda, thanks for hosting and uh, we'll be back in a month.